Just really quick, I wanted to remind you all that the Games and Online Harassment Hotline is here for you, for your friends and your colleagues. We provide emotional support to folks who make or play games, which is such a broad range of people. So, you know, you might not need it today, but maybe you need it tomorrow. So we just want you to know about it. You can learn more at gameshotline.org. As a viewer, I watched this. There was a part of me that was like, yeah, because the criminals that we're confronted with are so wild and feral and basically subhuman that we want them to be dispatched. We need to like interrogate that shit. Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Sarkeesian, and I'm joined today by two women who will wipe you off the face of the earth in a friendly game of Nukem. Carolyn Pettit. Hey, hey. And Ebony Adams. I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> oh, God. This week, we're taking on the hyper-violent 80s sci-fi action film, RoboCop. Uh, when you, <laughs> when I read Nukem, I kept being like, Duke Nukem? Yeah. Duke Nukem. We're going to Duke Nukem. Yeah. Game Nukem. I can't, and my brain yes. can't compute the non-existence of those two words together. Yes. But you All right, we'll be, be right back. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, fine. That's fine. Okay, we'll be yeah, right back. That's good. Great. Hi, hello, hi. Okay, so, okay, in our script, we have the intro, and it's just like, hey, here's who's on the show, here's what we're talking about, and then, yeah. like, we, like, stay tuned, you know, with a little ditty of music that you just heard, and then the intro banter, but I was like, well, why don't I say what the movie is, and then comment on the intro, and then yeah. stay tuned, and clearly that didn't work very well. <laughs> it really, it threw, it threw me off completely, just absolutely, completely threw me off. Um, uh, did you have something really important to add to my... No, I just wanted to make sure, because you were saying that the Nukem made you think of Duke Nukem, which is very understandable, but Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that you know the actual reference I'm making, which is that in RoboCop, which we're, which we're not talking about RoboCop yet, by the way. This is intro banter. RoboCop, <laughs> RoboCop comes later. This is intro banter. Um, that in the ro- in RoboCop, there is a satirical commercial for a game called Nukem, where the family is like playing nuclear war with each other, and they they like oh my blow God. each other. Yes. Yeah, and so it's, just, it's a takeoff of, it was of Battleship, you know. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that, yes, okay. I want to well, make it not, clear. We to- are not talking about <laughs> RoboCop yet, but right. that game was fucking amazing. Yes. Um, and I also, I want to emphasize to people that our scripts literally do say intro banter. Like there's, it, a, oh, yeah. there's <laughs> that's a category. So I mean, when you yeah. hear us say something like, all right, let's, it's, let's, let's have some banter. It is because it, the script is literally ordering just, us to, to give a little yeah. intro And we bans. cannot deviate from the script. No, exactly. No, no. That's something we never do. It's, but it's, a, but also I like it. It's like a freestyle section, right? It's like, there's no, there's no, it's imp- improv. There's nothing. Set Carol, there. I'm going to drop just, a beat. You give me a few yeah. bars. Oh, Mm, yeah, no, no, we're not doing that. Um, uh, did you? You did not watch. I don't know why this made me think of this, but you did not watch Succession, Ebony, right? I watched the first episode, okay, and I right, was right. not in the place to keep watching it. And, and I want to it, because it is yeah. so good. But I was like, I'm in. I'm filled with such rage at these people. Oh, I haven't absolutely. reached the point where I can now enjoy feeling full of rage. The, so the only reason I ask is because uh, there is an amazing scene, which even if you don't watch the show, I encourage you to watch like this scene. I think it's probably on YouTube or whatever. Sometime in the second season where Kendall Roy, um, it, like there's a big bash cel- celebrating the achievements of his awful, you know, father, Logan Roy, played by the amazing uh, Brian Cox. And... Lo, uh, Kendall does a rap and, uh, you know, <laughs> I have seen was, that on YouTube. Yep. <laughs> and it's like, it, and it goes stuff like, um, L to the O G A N. Um, <laughs> right. And it's spectacularly awful. And everyone is like embarrassed. And I mean, you know, who's like, am- whose reactions are amazing. Uh, it are, um, Kieran Culkin, like the way mm-hmm. Kieran Culkin just can look like mortified and embarrassed, but like, uh, it, it, anyway, so if I were to try to, um, you know, freestyle in that regard in any way it would be uh, equally as bad if not worse than Kendall Roy rapping about his father that's why that was the thought process I mean you're not mind. talking us out of this Carolyn exactly right, exactly right. because right. well this this analogy is very apropos because I do see myself as the Logan Roy of this yeah. podcast <laughs> yes yeah I don't even um, know what that means but I think it's funny but if you watch succession you'll be like oh yes yeah 
Ebony you know, is the evil mastermind behind this. She gives, it, she gives, and then withholds love. You know, she has, she has absolutely, you know, formulated a a situation in which no one ever wins but her. Yeah, Succession is one of those shows where um, I'm like, oh, I should watch this because it's like really celebrated, but it doesn't really feel like my wheelhouse. But that's okay. And then I completely forget about it. And every time I see someone post about, it, I'm like, oh, I should watch that. And then I never remember when I have a new show to watch. And like, yeah. I will just never. I'm sure I will I, never watch this show. I think you should give it a chance because the characters on it are so fascinating and so like tightly drawn. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like at least. Like it, it, it is so interesting in the way that it's it's so much about, like as I think I said in my freak out about it. Like for me, there's such that tension in the show of like, well, it's about this fantastically wealthy show, or or excuse me, this fantastically wealthy white you know family, um, and it's clearly trying to be critical. Um, you know, it's trying to be like these people are morally bankrupt and and reprehensible, but. You're also, of course, being completely sucked into the drama of their lives. And like, how can you not sympathize with them at some time at some point in that regard? So I don't know. And and so, like, is it at least, you know, you may you may bounce off of it. I don't know. But I mean, you know, I think it would there might be stuff there that you kind of get, think about at least and get get interested in thinking about, like, is this working as as a critique or is it a complete failure or what have you? I'm going to make Tune a prediction in next here. Week for Carolyn Pettit succession podcast. Yeah. I'm going to make yes. a prediction here. Anita, you're going to watch a couple of episodes and you're going to explode with feedback in our Slack. Yeah. You're going to have mm-hmm. so much to say and be like, we have to talk about this on the pod. <laughs> That's what I'm predicting. I mean, right. the, your prediction comes from a uh, basis in reality. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> experience mm-hmm. lived experience. Yeah. Because when I'm watching it, it's like the only time, the first time it's ever happened. And so clearly, yeah. and Let's like, you know, obviously like with Shit's Creek and stuff, it's like, oh my God, do you know about this show when everyone's already fucking watched it? I will treasure the WhatsApp messages from you about Star Trek when you watch like new episodes of Discovery. I'm never going to delete those. I, I got to download them and then print them out and put them in like a, a fireproof safe because they're so good. <laughs> okay. Well... That said, let's move on to the main segment part of the show. <laughs> Again, our script literally says this. Yeah, yeah. That was my transition. I worked on that really hard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Part man, part machine, all cop. That was the original tagline for the 1987 film RoboCop, one of the first American films by Dutch filmmaker Paul Verhoeven, who would go on to direct films like Total Recall, Basic Instinct, Starship Troopers, and Showgirls. But what kind of movie is RoboCop? Depending on who you ask, you're liable to get some very different answers. To some, it's a mid-tier 80s action film, the sort of movie you might watch if you came across it on cable, but hardly worthy of serious discussion. To others, it represents the worst excesses of the era, pushing its violence to the extreme at a time when brutal violence at the multiplex was already becoming too normalized. And then there are those who see RoboCop as a brilliant work of Reagan-era satire, a film that skewers the pro-corporate policymaking and ruthless cutting of social services that took place in the 1980s. But what do the three of us think of RoboCop? Well, let's find out. I know that Carolyn is of the latter <laughs> of those. Yeah. But, yes. okay, hold on. Before we start, um, some of you already know this if you listen to our bonus episodes, but the reason we chose RoboCop is because I happened to mention in passing that I'd never seen it, and both Carolyn and Ebony were like, what? Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I, and the only, re- I mean, because it's, I think it has established itself in the years and decades since it came out as a kind of cultural landmark. Not because I thought, wow, Anita's going to love this movie, because I sure did not think that. But just that, like, you know, it, it's, it, it has a certain, it has a, a, a accrued a certain reputation for being, like, a, a, a film that is, you know, that, that people, that people talk about, right? Mm-hmm. And that people think comments on the, on the eighties and on Reagan and, and all that in, in ways that are, that are interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I just uh, more nonsense before we get into the actual content of basically before Carolyn does her uh, 40 minute (laughs) essay that she's (laughs) pre-written about. And then we just say like, we agree. That's great. Really really (laughs) great. Yeah. Um, The um, apparently um, Paul Verhoeven uh, did not like the script 
uh, very aggressively didn't like it and passed on it many times until his wife talked him into it to be like, you aren't seeing it. Look, read yes. it again, you yes. know, um, which is very in line with um, a lot of like I had talked about. Um, you must remember this podcast about uh, Polly Platt. And there's just so much in there about like the wives of directors. Right. Just like mm. giving them vision. And it's not just Polly Platt. Like there's some other people that they're talking about, like providing vision, working collaboratively, like, you know, really convincing them to take certain jobs because they see the vision um of it and, and that sort of thing so that just that little tidbit reminded me a little bit of um sexism um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just reminded me a little it had a whiff of sexism too um the other thing I'd, i i want to say too is that i think so i've um i've obviously seen starship troopers um but I, I think I would have been super fucking thrown off if I hadn't seen Starship Troopers. Like Interesting. Like Robocop has a lot of that like sort of campy like there's a, a, a filmmaking style that is in in line with both of these films, which I know are different and we can get into all that, but that there's like I I, I think I was uh, more prepared for this um unintentionally because I was already familiar with because this this movie is fucking wackadoodle. Yes. You know, and like if I went into it without realizing that it was like or ever having seen anything like that before, I think it would have thrown me. Mm. I mean, in your so I, I haven't heard your your discussions about Starship Troopers. So just did in your mind, does Starship Troopers work as like a satirical, you know, film? Or? Yes. OK, I, I think it does. I know Ebony. Okay. Disagrees. I, yeah, hard disagree. And so just want to shout out. Uh, Mary Robinette Kowal for upholding uh, my view on this, the correct view, which is that the film, and we'll get into it with RoboCop, um, that the film yeah. aims for a certain type of satire that I do not think it successfully achieves. Sure, um, I also sure. think that the the target of the satire um, it, it honestly benefits from, you know, the kind of left reading that we've talked about before, but we'll we'll get into that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so RoboCop, I mean, so watching this film, you know, now in 2021, uh, because I'm in a different place ideologically and I have different just awarenesses or deeper awarenesses <laughs> of things than I did when I've seen this film previously, it was a different experience for me. I think mm -hmm. particularly, you know, where maybe where I want to start is like just the way that police as a, as an entity are positioned in this film. Oh, um, so, because, like, in this film, like, I think one thing you have to, like, just kind of accept baseline for this whole film to, like, work is that, it, you know, at least within the world of RoboCop, um, police are workers. Like, they are, you know, in the sense of being, like, working class, like, labor, you know, laborers, and, th like, they are, you know, this, like, beleaguered um, uh group um who you know are very uh uh exploited and like very um and you know we should you know like our sympathies kind of lie with police as like just decent like hard-working people who put it all on the line to like keep you know to keep us safe and in fact so like the ca like the captain of the, the station you know who uh, isn't like much of a developed character in this film but but he makes a strong impression in the mm -hmm. brief time that that we do spend with him is for me like um I, I I will admit like is for me like an archetype that I think was was way more common in films in the 80s of a particular kind of cop that I that I just I mean you know to to my own maybe frustration or dismay I find kind of irresistible yeah um the kind of um, and and other examples of th this kind of cop that I'm thinking of are like um, the cops in in the film Highlander, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the cops like the cops played by um, Lance Henriksen and um, Paul Oh in in Terminator. Uh, what's that? Uh, what's that great actor's name? Um, uh, you know, anyway, the two cops in, in Terminator. Anyway, yeah. like these cops who are like. Um, working like just kind of weary working class like but it's a job but they also take it seriously but you know there's something kind of cynical about them and i don't know like i just that it just works on me like catnip i can't resist it as like an, a movie archetype kind of persona thing and anyway um so yeah like that's that's for me was one interesting thing about this film is just that the way that cops are so you know in its in its dynamic this film's dynamic of 
of corporate corporations exploiting and like dehumanizing workers. Um, obviously, like Murphy is the is the ultimate symbol of of like how of a corporation like dehumanizing a person, like taking him in, like literally without his consent upon death, essentially repurposing his body, turning it into in their eyes like a a product that they put out that also militarizes the police. Um, you know, the cops are the cops are the stand in here for like for like exploited working class uh, uh, people who are like talking about, should we go on strike? And like, you know, all, all of these kinds of things. But whereas today I understand that like police are not workers in that sense. And police unions are not unions in the sense of like labor unions that we should actually support. And, you know, and all of this, um, uh, certainly I did not have that, that critique built in before. And the, and I was more willing to accept the, the police in that role uh, within this film and like feeling the sympathy in those early moments where the captain comes in and like takes the the name of like oh the latest casualty mm-hmm. in their war on crime off the board and like the feeling of um you know s- sort of disheartening um uh, morale that fills the the locker room and all of that you know um anyway yeah um yeah i so i saw this film as a kid because as yes. y'all know <laughs> by now my dad had real interesting standards for what was appropriate for children and what was inappropriate. And so I saw this film, I don't know how many times as a kid. And like you, Caro, my understanding of what was going on was absolutely um, formed by kind of our, our social understanding of the inherent need for police. There's no question mm-hmm. that the police are a fundamental good in this film um, and in society at large, the the critique is with the corporate ownership of police and the yes. excesses yes. that that will necessarily come from that. But there's never a question that the police are out there saving people. They are the sort of like last bastion against like the the savagery and you know primitive releases that that you know um, that a city like Detroit, which by the way, in the world of this film, almost entirely white, which makes me laugh so hard as an adult. Um, but yeah, the idea of like the, of policing as a noble activity and the people who do it as inherently noble, um, was something that I just accepted, you know, as a young person, I remember so clearly you pointed out, um, uh, the, the police captain Reed, I think when he Mm -hmm. says, you know, uh, about the dissatisfaction of some of the the street officers, you know, who are planning perhaps to strike. He's like, and police don't strike. I remember thinking like, yeah, like this yeah. guy, you know, like there's something heroic about this gruff, right. as you say, or- world weary. Yeah. And, you know, it, it stuck with me. This mm-hmm. notion that like the police should be um, it, like admired and uplifted as this tool of the state that we need to protect ourselves from ourselves. So when RoboCop, you know, is finally unleashed upon the streets, the question is not whether he, his firepower is, you know, too excessive for his job. The question is like, why don't we have more people with the kind of like fundamental goodness of him, you know, on the streets because it would take care of these, these like um, cartoonish rapists or the liquor store uh, mugger, you know, Uh and people like Clarence Boddicker, right? It's like the, the film posits these people, these kinds of people exist and we need folks who are willing and able to take advantage of them. The problem is just that we have like craven corporate mercenaries um, who are in charge of those folks. Yeah. I, I, I don't have a lot more to add to all of that brilliance. Uh, I was just thinking about how like, and part of how this falls apart quickly is that um, the, the, the sympathetic police are the foil or are, are the ways to make us think that the corporations are bad. Yeah. Right. Like their existence in this movie is like, lit is, is directly tied to how we think about the corporations being awful. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that scene where the woman is being assaulted by those two dudes, you know, um, and RoboCop in the shoots- montage in the <laughs> RoboCop is amazing montage. <laughs> Well, I mean, specifically the one like that he come, he stumbles upon, I think right after the liquor store robbery that he diffuses, during which, by the way, he 
perpetrates way more violence, you know, and damage on that store than <laughs> would have been done in, during the course of that robbery. But um, so he saves this woman from being, you know, raped and assaulted by these two thugs, right? Raped. And then at the end, you know, she's like hugging on him. And thank you Dude. so much, right? And he <sighs> says, like, I can direct you to the nearest rape crisis center. <laughs> and I just thought, like, if this is not s- such a perfect illustration of why the police are unnecessary, they don't prevent crimes in the real world, nor do they usually solve crimes. But also, can you imagine being directed to a rape crisis center by a figure like Robocop, like this huge Transformers body of an emotional estate? This is precisely like, and just to sort of like uncaring. That's not what this woman needs in this moment, you know? But that's sort of all the imagination we have. And yet, like, I have to, I have to admit that, like, uh, for what, I, I mean, and, you know, these are all, these, these are the kinds of films that make me, like, take a closer look at myself. But there is a way in which I, there are things about this film that in, in another film would make me write it off, you know, or make me be like, you know, fuck this. Whereas in this film, I almost see them as like delicious internal contradictions that add mm-hmm. a kind of like complexity to the film because the way that it offers on one hand, like the fantasy of the super powered cop keeping us safe. What, that's totally where we, you know, are totally meant to go like, hell yeah, like, wow, yeah. Robocop, like punched through the wall and like got the, the you know, the, 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 the guy, the hijacker, the guy with the, mm-hmm. yeah, the, the prisoners and everything. Um you know, and yet, like it, it's 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 also trying to uh, to sort of um, to direct our ire at um, at at this corporation, um, you know, OCP in this case that um, that you know uses this rhetoric of of um, of well, if we you know if we can just like develop old Detroit into whatever it's called delta city or whatever and then and then the cr- the hotbed of crime will be gone like we're doing good work we can do this but of course ocp is is actually like fueling and profiting off of that crime like explicitly i think there's all for me there another interesting thing about watching this film today is the ways in which the viol- the violence in it um has you know d- maybe lacks the power um, that it did uh, when this film was released, because when this film was originally shot and released, um, they they actually had to go through multiple edits and cuts with the you know the uh, MPAA to get it down from like an NC seventeen rating because it was like it was so excessively violent by the standards of the day and. And it was violent to a degree that I think most viewers or, you know, at least many viewers at the time would have it would have had an effect on people. You know, it, it would have been so extreme that it, at a certain point it makes you go like what it t- kind of takes you out of out of it um, and, and becomes a kind of c- extreme, you know, commentary as opposed to being like pure visceral thrill. But but today it doesn't it no longer maybe feels that that like outrageous that far Mm -hmm. beyond what we are, what we are used to. And it almost feels like standard action movie violence. So, so I think in, you know, in that sense, I think the, the kind of framing device or the, the use, the dispersal throughout the film of these um, news segments is so essential. And because that is where we still get that like winking um, kind of satirical, quality the way that you have like so lisa gibbons who was right. at the time like an actual entertainment tonight um uh, anchor kind of you know uh, bubbly tv personality as one of these you know anchors kind of you know delivering news with like a wink and a smile of like a satellite like just just you know m- murdered a hundred people in in somewhere in california today mm-hmm. including like three ex-presidents that's where you <laughs> you you kind of understand that this film is is trying to work on a level other than just like pure straightforward um you know action entertainment and to to do something a little um uh, de- you know a little more comp- complicated than that yeah yeah absolutely um i i love a 
corporations are evil narrative. Sure. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, Um, and I feel like, I don't know. I honestly, when we came into to talking about this, I was like, I don't, I have nothing to say about RoboCop. So bear with me because I'm working this out. But, you know, like there, this does fall into like, it is clear that what this corporation is doing is bad, right? It is clear that like the, the privatization uh, sort of neoliberal philosophy that has taken over the police industry or the, the, um, the, not police industry, the law enforcement um, Mm -hmm. space, you know, like there's a line where one of the characters from the corporation say like, we're, we are practically the military. Like what's Mm -hmm. the fucking difference now? Like it's all been privatized. Um, So there is clearly like structural analysis here uh, of that. Um, But it really like it hyper focuses so much on, you know, these two really one, but these two like executives that are, um, you know, developing the tech and that are in conflict. And one of the executives is obviously corrupt and working with, you know, like the the bad guys in Detroit so that like they continue the violence so that there is value to um, or or use of this, this, you know, of of the corporation. Um, So their stocks can increase and all that. But you get to kind of the end of it. And it's like, well, you know, there's that there's that moment where you you learn <laughs> what directive four is. And it's mm-hmm. like you can't murder an executive from the company as RoboCop. Um, and then or arrest. The, you can't you can't. I mean, not oh, just yeah. murder, but you can't arrest. arrest them. You cannot. He cannot mm-hmm. do. He, he, yeah. he is ineffectual against. Totally. Them. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and so the the he- like the CEO guy is like you're fired, and then RoboCop gets to kill him, and it's a whole like cathartic moment. But to me, I'm like it 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 kind of erased the fact that like that CEO is also bad. You know, like he he yeah. ends up he ends up coming out in a in a very subtly because it happens quickly, but in a way that you're like, oh well, the bad guys have been taken out, so therefore this corporation is still okay to some degree. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yes. I, it definitely almost, I think in RoboCop 2, which is a truly terrible film that I don't recommend anyone watch for any reason whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but I think in that film, the old, the character who's actually known as the old man, that, that figure, um, is revealed to be like really shitty as well. I could be wrong about that. But yes, like in this film, um, it, it definitely is with the bad apple of Dick Jones has been kind of taken out. And maybe now OCP will not be like so, so, you know, so heinous. But but it's so interesting. Like, I mean, um, so the other, you know, um, uh, Bob Morton played so with so much energy mm-hmm. by the by the late, great Miguel Ferrar, um, you know, one of many just great actor, you know, great performances in this film, I think. Um, he, I mean, you know, like. Like the thing it's it's there's just for me again, like that internal contradiction built into the fact that like the Robocop, you know, project OCP's Robocop project is inherently like deeply immoral, like just right. deeply like right. f- incredibly fucking immoral. Right. And yet and yet and yet we as viewers like and yet and yet Robocop is what ends up like like taking out Dick Jones. You know, we're, we're also meant to like be glad that robocop exists I, I i don't know what to make of that right it's 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 it, it does seem to me to be this like this internal um contradiction that that's 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 interesting um yeah, this is yeah. this, this is ultimately the same problem that i have with starship troopers and you'll have to forgive me because i have not seen it since it came out um but i remember my impression being that yes this film is clearly trying to satirize something but what it thinks it's satirizing, it's it's actually not. It's it's doing something else. But because the broad strokes of its satire are so appealing and so funny and so outrageous, you know, perhaps it's it's a it's obfuscating um, the fact that in the end, ultimately, we are glad for the military because there is this external threat that society at right. large is ill-equipped to deal with, right? So the question is not, you know, whether there should be a military colonizing imperialist force. The the laughter comes because they're so, you know, crypto-fascist and because, you know, there, there's all of that set dressing around it. But the fundamental question of whether we need to have a military or in right. RoboCop, whether we need to have super-powered police who, remember, RoboCop says to every criminal he encounters, it does not matter the crime, 
dead or alive, you're coming with me. Mm-hmm. This should send yeah. a like a chill through every like viewer the- because this is precisely how cops operate, right? This power over life and death. And we as audience members and we as members of this society have just come to accept that capital, the capital punishment meted out by law enforcement is fundamentally just and we can trust their judgment, you know? And it is terrifying that as a viewer, I watch this. And yeah, like you say, Carol, like there was a part of me that was like, yeah, because the criminals that we're confronted with are so wild and feral and basically subhuman that we want them to be dispatched. We need to like interrogate that shit, you know? Yeah, well, and this film would be massively different if it wasn't like, like RoboCop is created to put out the fact that like the, like you're saying they're cartoonishly villainous, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If they weren't, this movie would operate a little bit better as a satire because it would mm-hmm. show the the aggressive force of the police over people who are just trying to like get food for their family or like, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, what have or you. Or just like, yeah, I black teenagers with, hanging out on the corner, you know? Yeah, exactly. And like that would be so much more powerful. And that that might be a way to make a this kind of satirical analysis today right where the audience is a little more privy and a little more savvy around some of these issues or some audiences at least i Um, think with starship troopers though is i think in robocop there are mo there are there are there are people to be sympathetic to right there's like the the lady cop and her her love of murphy there's murphy himself who was like you know stuck in this position i think in in starship troopers there aren't there isn't that type of sympathy for anybody so i think it it lands differently <sighs> yes <sighs> yeah i don't want to you know spend the next you know four yeah, hours no, and also you and i yeah. both haven't seen it in a while so who fucking knows whatever yeah, um yeah. okay but sorry go ahead I, no no i, I was yeah, gonna you... move us on to something else oh, move well, us on. <laughs> okay. uh cool carolyn you go so, I mean, yeah, I, uh, bleh, let me think of a, uh, um, um, Oh, real quick before you move on. Um, am I correct in that the writer of the, the writer of the screenplay, which was adapted from the book, it is, but is the same writer who wrote Robocop. So you have both the writer and director returning for Robocop and then Starship Troopers. I don't know the answer to that, but it does remind me oh, of what? an interesting comment that, that, um, one of the screenwriters of RoboCop said about RoboCop, which is that he called it, and I think this pertains to what we were just saying, he he has called the film, at least elements of it, quote, fascism for liberals. Mm-hmm. So um, anyway, I think wow. there's um, something interesting there. Um, Ma- so Michael Miner is credited as the writer on RoboCop, and he was not involved in... You see, I'm seeing Edward Nymeyer um, credited on... I, I think there are multiple writers for this project. Yeah, they were right. co- co-writers of, of RoboCop, yeah. I believe. Um, and so, um, and Edward Nymeyer is the writer of Starship Troopers. Oh, so. uh, okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think, I mean, I do want to talk a little bit about the the humanity, the, the theme of humanity in, in RoboCop, in the sense of Robo... of, you know, once Murphy... It becomes RoboCop. Um, the film it does try to like explore um, what you know, what vestiges of Murphy remain in RoboCop, and and for me, like it's interesting to me that in this film that is so in some ways broadly satirical and is so like extreme in its violence, like this stuff actually really works. And I think even though it's 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 done in a very economical way, I mean, this is a pretty short film to begin with. Um, like just the, the 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 elements of of you know of uh, Anne Lewis played by Nancy Allen you know seeing Murphy in the hall seeing RoboCop in the hallway and like those first person views we get from Murphy of like Lewis approaching him and being like Murphy it's it's you um and then you you know you feel this tug of like the the exploration of of what's left of Murphy but. I think what's uh, maybe obviously the most interesting sort of centerpiece scene of that whole thematic exploration is the scene where Murphy returns to the home that he shared with his wife and son, which is now on the market. It's being sold. And um, you get the super imposition in a way of like Murphy's memories of that home, of his wife, of his son with this now empty, vacated place and part of what 
part of what's interesting to me about that scene is like the house. It, it's literally on a street called Primrose Lane. Mm-hmm. It's this it's this suburb, this like idyllic suburb that could not feel more safe and more removed from like the chaos and the violence of of quote unquote of old Detroit that we spend most of the of the film in. Right. It feels like this absolute like pure just wonderful suburban safe haven that somehow is part of the same city, you know, uh, as, as, as <laughs> where that, that takes place. Yeah. But um, yeah, like I, I actually think the relationship between Lewis and Murphy is, is really interesting. And, and I think this weirdly for maybe, maybe not weirdly, I don't know, but the scene between them at the, you know, the old steel mill or whatever it is where um, she's like helping him, you know, like target stuff again. And like, I, I, there was a comment in the Wikipedia page. Some critic was like that, you know, it's quoted in the Wikipedia page. Some critic had said like, you know, uh, Mur- uh, Lewis helping Murphy, like shoot the, the bottles of, you know, quote, the quote unquote baby food that Robocop eats, I guess. Um, you know, it symbolizes like the domestic life that is like out of reach for them. And, mm. And I don't, and like, I, that's a really interesting reading to me. And I don't know. I, I just, I think for me, like the film would not be as interesting as it is if it didn't have that, that element of like Murphy, the soul of Murphy and like what, you know, what, what humanity Murphy retains um, as RoboCop kind of coursing, coursing through it. Yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. I, um, I, I'm thinking about that scene where Murphy comes to his, his old house and, you know, flashes back um, to those scenes with his wife and his goofy ass child. Um, (laughs) And just thinking like, (laughs) I mean, again, I'm watching this, I'm rewatching this now in 2021. Right. So with the um, perspective of, of someone who is deeply suspicious of the police. Um, and so I'm just like, yeah, of course this motherfucker doesn't live in old Detroit, just like the police yeah, don't live right, right, you right. Know, in the areas um, that they patrol, right? And that, that what he is missing and what we want for him to maintain um, is access to this space of whiteness and middle-class yes. protection that's unavailable to the working-class people that we see uh, in old Detroit. Like, we want there to be a separation for Murphy. And we, in fact, think that, like, it um, truly effective elimination of the threats in old Detroit relies upon his distance from, you know, the depravity and the felt there. Like, there's there's a part of, um, of him part of what makes him so effective is the fact that he is not from there. Um, and so he's got like that necessary sort of like, you know, I don't know, law enforcement objectivity or something, but yeah, it's just the weirdest. <sighs> yeah. I'm not sure um, what I think about it, but that's very interesting because I had not thought about that scene where, um, where Lewis is helping him, you know, recalibrate his sights with that baby food. I hadn't thought about it in that I way. Mean, but that's very interesting. To me, it, yeah, that is a much more deeper analysis. To me, I was like, oh, this is the romance scene. You, like, I mean, just the, like, the, the think, obligatory, yeah. like, whatever, we're yeah. throwing this in there. But, like, yeah, I didn't think about it as the baby food stuff because I was and like, oh, if, well, that's what he eats. And even if we do view it as, like, a, ro- a you know, that we feel that little tinge of, of romantic potential there, I mean, there's something interesting in that in that it can never happen, right? They're, like, it's not, it's not like, like they're going to have a romance at all. Right. Like it's, it's this, it's all it is, is this like little hint of maybe what, maybe what's what Murphy, you know, can never have in his life again because of what, what, you know, another example of what he, he's lost as a result of being robocopped. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess, <laughs> Robocop. I guess I didn't see it as like, you know, it, with even a tinge of romance, but I do see it as a kind of intimacy that, you know, he no longer has access to and human closeness. Yeah. Um, right. And yeah, right. and, and we That's do, what I mean. yeah. we do feel sad, you know, and he's got his face place taken on we can see his giant, you know, head and Peter Weller cheekbones, which are, you know, so angular, you could, you know, hang the entire RoboCop suit from them. I, this film at the same time that I'm like, holy shit, there's so much here to unpack. There was a part of little ebony remembering watching this when i was like eight years old which again inappropriate for an eight-year-old dad 
um, where I was just like, yeah, you know, it was profoundly mm-hmm. satisfying. I, yeah. Yeah. I want to, um, I, I want to just talk a little bit about like the visuals of this, um, mm-hmm. of this film. So there's a lot of, one of the things that's really interesting about it is the, like the, the shot choices. So you have like these really intense first person perspective moments where, um, that, that go on for a while. So you learn that, that RoboCop is being built and Murphy is being built as RoboCop through his eyes. Um, mm-hmm. with like the different, the, the different team or, or sorry, not different, but the team that's building him and like over time and what that looks like and how mm-hmm. they're treating him. Like, I thought that was a really nice way of, of showing an otherwise like stuffy technological build, right? That it humanized the like, holy shit, this is totally immoral <laughs> that they like took this dead body yeah. uh, and brought him and, and it turned him into RoboCop. Right. Um, and they do that a couple of times that first person kind of. Yeah. exploration um which i i thought I, I really appreciated the other thing that i couldn't get over was that this film is shot almost like a, i don't know if this is true but it felt like the majority of the shots were from a low like a low to high angle mm-hmm. which was mm. so interesting because like it, it was so common and done so frequently in this film and that's not like i don't know quote unquote normal and so one of the things that like low angle does, especially like on a person, is it makes them look really powerful, right? Because mm-hmm. you're looking up at them. They're really big. But even wide shots, like especially one of the like battle shots near the end, like you see the warehouse and the car and everything from like the bottom right angle up. Um, and I just thought that was such an interesting like seeing like you're seeing this city from the ground, right? You're seeing it from the bottom sort of gritty layer of it up upwards right and i don't know if that's like i don't know symbolic of you know the the corporations at the top and you're looking up because you're the little guy or what have you but Mm -hmm. it it was just it it struck me Mm -hmm. it struck me as a very interesting visual choice for telling the story that like clearly is different enough than what we're used to in filmmaking today you know Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um i also i also think you know uh i have to give credit to i mean it's interesting peter weller is you know in that suit for most of this movie um and and it's almost it's almost unfortunate because i i in in the sense that because i do think that in the early part of the film when he is still just alex murphy that he does have a great like warmth and humanity to him and it and you know it does make me i i do sometimes wish that peter weller had had more of a of a kind of me you know he's buckaroo bonsai and this or whatever but like i kind of wish he'd had more of a mainstream you know, star career. Um, but the physicality of uh, that he brings to the, to RoboCop, it, like is essential to, to the way this film works. And, and it's so it's, it works so well, like yeah. the, the movement, the way RoboCop moves really does kind of make you believe it, it, the, in the, in the mechanical, you know, mm-hmm. mechanized nature of, of that figure. Yeah. Um, so. Absolutely. Um, in the bonus, we are gonna have to talk about the monster Robocop and the mutant fish splattery thing that ha- there's we're, sure we're gonna get more into, <laughs> into this in the bonus for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, cool. La- awesome. Last thoughts? Shall we wrap up? Uh, no, but if you haven't seen Robocop yet, but you are a fan of 80 cinema, well, if you're a fan of 80 cinema, then you probably have seen Robocop, but it does tick all the boxes. It's got boobs, Coke and bullets. So check it out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, also, apparently, Paul Verhoeven has a new film. Um, yes. And now called Benedetta. 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 I don't know. Benedetta. I think it's yeah, yeah Benedetta. Yeah. Uh, if you know, you're curious what he's been up to. That's the thing. <laughs> that is yeah. never the case. <laughs> I have never <laughs> asked that question. <laughs> what is Paul Verhoeven up to? I don't know. You might. You might. And I'm telling you, I don't. All right. We'll be back with some freakouts. Hey, are you enjoying the show? If you are, we would love you to support us to keep making it. You know, if you become one of our patrons, not only are you going to do that and allow us to keep making this every week, but also you get access to some perks like bonus episodes, Uh, participate in polls to determine future episodes, access to our Discord server, which is only available to patrons, uh, and, you know, I don't know, other things. If you love us, help support us. You can do that at patreon.com slash femfreak.
Now it's time to talk about what's been thrilling us, moving us, upsetting us, or infuriating us this past week. Carolyn? Yeah, I want to talk about this uh, four-part um, documentary. I, I, I guess you characterize it as a documentary. Hybrid, hybrid documentary, you know, uh, uh, fil- film um, uh, on HBO Max called exterminate all the brutes um mm. it is directed by raul peck who is a haitian filmmaker who um I mean, you know most famously within the past several years uh, directed uh, i am not your negro the documentary about about james baldwin um and this film this yeah this film is it is um, of course, no, no, no four hour film can be the history of white supremacy and settler colonialism, but it is a history of white supremacy and settler, you know, colonialism. And it is, um, you know, but it's also deeply, a uh, deeply personal uh, film. Peck brings himself his own, you know, uh, he, like home movies of himself as a young boy in, in you know, Brooklyn and in, and in Haiti and, you know, um, uh, you know, just elements from his own life um, into into the film. He it's so it's it's an interesting, a very much like a, as I say, an interesting kind of hybrid film because you have like you know infographs about just like you know the slave trade and like just like or staggering uh, you know injustices and and uh, things like that. But then you know it's interspersed with like imagery from Hollywood films that perpetuates racism or um or or footage shot you know shot just for um for exterminate all the brutes there's a a running device of of you know quasi historical scenes in which um Josh Hartnett um it was sort of re- is a recurring recurring you know appears in a recurring way as perhaps you could say like a a symbol or a, you know, uh, of, of like white supremacy and settler colonialism, like in these various sort of historical contexts. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat conflicted about this series to be, to be honest, of course, I'm fully uh, on board, uh, like with, with it's, you know, it's, it's the argument that it's making and with, with what it's saying and, and the urgency of it. And, um, and I do want to, so, so Raul Peck narrates the film himself. And I want to say also, he has a, an absolutely like a mesmerizing, uh, voice, uh, as a narrator, a voice that, that really just kind of cuts through everything and just works its way into your, into your mind with its, um, it's just, uh, straightforward kind of, um, yeah, it's direct, it's directness and, and it's just it, the quality of it. Um, you know, I, I am, as I've alluded to, you know, in, in other recent episodes, I am, you know, in, increasingly like unsure of the effectiveness that, that, that can be, you know, or that, that can be had by, um, deploying, you know, sort of violent imagery, um, you know, of imagery of, uh, of like oppression and and murder and you know white supremacy and what have you, um, you know on viewers you know on white viewers who who ourselves have internalized white supremacy by growing up in it and living in it all of our lives. I'm not sure that it disrupts anything, you know, or at least it needs to be used in in a particular way. Certainly, and and there is you know there is a great deal of like historical photography and imagery in this film that that is um, violent and is uh, difficult uh, to to see to be sure, um, you know. And and which so watching this and not, not to make an unjust or an unfair comparison, I'm not directly comparing these two things, but I am you know uh, um, curious to see, and we're going to talk about it. I think next season on the podcast, uh, the the, uh, the new Barry Jenkins series, The Underground. Railroad, which obviously is a slave, you know, a narrative about the slave trade, but which so I I've heard or, you know, many people say um, is not does not um, deploy the imagery uh, of, you know, of slavery in in the same 
ways that maybe a lot of uh, historical dramas and what you know ha have. Um, so I'm very I'm very curious to see how that film, how that series approaches it. And it draws on a few books um, that I think it's noteworthy to mention. One of those books being uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. You know, that is source material for Exterminate All the Brutes. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, um, so, I mean, it's very well, re it's incredibly well researched. It's, it's filled with, uh, it, you know, both, you know, just uh, fat, the kind of facts and hard data and, and historical, you know, truths that you cannot look away from or deny, you know, and also some, you know, real visual poetry, some, it's art, it's, you know, it, it is a fascinating hybrid. Um, so uh, I admire it a great deal. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel it's, it's important. It's an important work. Uh, obviously, it, its message is, is, of course, as, as timely now as ever. Um, and so, you know, I, I, although I do not feel compelled to give it like a wholehearted, unambiguous endorsement, um, I, I do encourage people to, at least, you know, be aware of it, know that it's out there, know that it's extremely well, well done, well researched, um, you know, and, and, and really the work of a, uh, uh, you know, of a great filmmaker, um, and, you know, um, consider, maybe consider, consider watching it. Awesome. Wow. All right, cool. Um, I got a little freak out. Mm -hmm. So Claire North is one of my favorite authors. Um, she, I've probably talked about these books, um, I've read several of hers. My favorites are The First 15 Lives of Harry August and um, 84K. And one of the things I love about her is that she, I just, I, I'm blown away by the creativity of people, <laughs> especially like the sci-fi genre fantasy uh, authors that I read, where um, what she does so beautifully is she integrates like deep political messaging, but without being preachy about it ever. And I think that that's extremely difficult to do. And I think it's, it's you know, not not a lot of authors can can nail it um, in that way. And I just, without fail, the environments and stories that she creates around issues like anti-capitalism and environmentalism are just so profoundly interesting um, and engaging. And um, I cannot rave enough about how much I adore her writing. Um, so I was really fortunate and lucky to get an early copy of her new book called Notes from the Burning Age. And I'm almost done with it. Um, and it is it is exactly what I just said, like super fascinating. It takes place in this like utopian moment um, far into our future. And the burning age that is being referenced is right now. So in the in this utopian future, um, because we have already destroyed the planet in this moment in our lives, um, a sort of me mega religion has formed around um, protecting the planet and protecting nature. And so there are priests that um, preserve the any information that could be uh, damaging. And it's mm -hmm. all heretical. So, for example, the priests like lock away all of the heretical data around like building bombs and cars and mining and anything that could be uh, that could cause damage to the to the world. So that's like the environment in which this film, this film in which this book starts. And um, the the whole the, the whole conflict is that there is this brotherhood that starts up who is challenging that who wants to go back to this like hyper individual like you know every every kind of quote-unquote man for himself like let's exploit everything we can to be the most powerful to be the richest to be the most comfortable um and it's this tension between these two opposing forces um it's fucking fascinating and i don't want to say um who the protagonist is like there's a very particular point of view that is the um that you are following in this and and the experiences of this character but it's really it's really interesting the only caveat i will place on this is i had a really hard time getting into this book 
there's like a whole thing that happens at the beginning that I was like, God damn it, is this going to be the first book of hers I read that I don't like? <laughs> um, and there is a a little bit of the storytelling that like doesn't grip me the same way some of her other books do. But the concept of it and and really most of it is so fascinating that I do actually highly recommend it. The other thing is that I, again, think that she's such an amazing writer that she has these lines like she's so poetic in the way that she writes that I will literally get hung up on one sentence and reread it like five times before I keep going mm. because it's just such a beautiful way or such a fascinating or lyrical way of explaining uh, wh whatever it is that she's trying to say. So that book comes out on July 6th. It's called Notes from the Burning Age and the author is Claire North. Uh, Anita, have you ever read A Canticle for Leibowitz? No. Um, I mean, it's, it's not the same story, but it just, your summation of Notes from the Burning Age just reminds me of Canticle for Leibowitz, which is a classic um, science fiction um, text um, in which uh, in this, you know, post-apocalyptic world, um, the religion, which is sort of a modified version of Catholicism, you know, these these friars and monks and priests um, sort of have ownership of forbidden knowledge. Um, and it's, it's a very, like, long-ranging book that goes over, I think, thousands of years. And so you watch, like, the course of human civilization and society change. Um, but there's always this kind of... Um, you know, focal point of, of these, these friars amongst anyway, just reminded me of that. Oh yeah. Super cool. All right. Um, yeah. Great. Great. If you all, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, well, that's happening now. Um, Hey, we want to hear from you. So you can submit your own freak out at feministfrequency.com slash freak out. That's F R E Q O U T. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for listening to Feminist Frequency Radio. We are taking a little break, as we are known to do, and we'll be back on July 7th. Um, we, I know we're definitely going to be talking about the Underground Railroad in the next season of Feminist Frequency Radio and a bunch of other great stuff. So, you know, if you're not subscribed to us, like, maybe do that, and then you'll know as soon as we come back, right? That's yeah. That's how that works. Hell Yeah. Our show is engineered by Rob Para. Carrie Simpson provides technical support, artwork by Jamie Varon, and our intro music is by Phil Circus. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Bye.